think about narratives for a minute. This is my thesis. Um, narratives shape our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors. Our lives are actually lived as representations of those narratives and within the constraints created by the narratives. When narratives clash, either consciously or unconsciously, there can be a great source of personal and societal disruption. And on the other hand, properly utilized narrative can lead to peaceful, healthy, personal relationships, congregations, communities, where everyone can experience what uh, Jocelyn Talaferro at North Carolina State calls fully operationalized citizenship. For those who profess Christianity, there seems to be a strong emphasis on mandates for forgiveness and reconciliation, which I actually think are very different. Um, but if we're to fulfill those mandates, particularly one for reconciliation, we have to find different stories and develop a new vocabulary. This narrative turn, let's talk about the narrative turn. So in recent years, the theologians as well as other social scientists have started incorporating social constructionist frames in their analysis of society and organizations. And the way that these constructionist principles inform the use of narrative is this. We've come to the place where there is no intrinsic meaning in any experience. The meaning of every experience is socially constructed and stories become the primary mechanism for making and sharing meaning and observations. Most of the stories that shape meaning, although socially constructed, were socially constructed at some point and then just given to us. We receive them. They are embedded in our language, in our systems, in our structures, in ways that we never take the time to investigate. And if we took the time to investigate and discover the stories that are running our lives, many of them are not stories that we would necessarily agree with. And so we have to find the agency. It's only when you unveil the previously subjugated knowledge of those narratives that you are able to use your own agency to craft preferred narratives and move into a new space. We start learning this narrative structure when we're really young, pre-verbal almost, and we start developing a moral understanding at exactly the same time. Um, Bruno Badelheim, who's a psych psychoanalyst, talks about the way that children's stories, actually fairy tales like Jack and the Beanstalk, Cinderella, help children to work through internal conflicts and manage crises. Fairy tales, according to Badelheim, many of which end with this notion of living happily ever after, they give children confidence to face a world and hope for positive outcomes. But what I add to that is because many of those fairy tales are formulated on the basis of either subtle or explicit moral code, they also work to encourage conformity to a specific range of thought behavior, and they reproduce moral propositions or a performative way of being that reproduces the world constructed and imagined inside of those stories. So we believe the fairy tales, we believe the mythology, we believe the history that gets passed down to us and then live inside of it as though it is the only available truth. Dan McAdams calls these narratives like life myths. And then the characters who, who populate those myths, he calls those imagos. So the myth-making process is really interesting because first when children are learning, you learn categories of things. This is animal, this is plant, this is dog, this is cat, this is daddy, this is mommy. You learn categories of things, but inside of the naming of it, there's already an embedded discourse about what's appropriate. And so you learn dog and cat as possibly inside animals that are friendly and safe and other animals as outside animals that are either unsafe or savory, right? They're good for eating, they're good for food. We make those kinds of distinctions. And children, before they have bought into our notions of time and space, can tell some of the most amazing stories because they're not limited by our construct of time and space or the limitations that are placed on certain kind of objects, which is why you can say, hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. All of that makes fine sense when you're a child, right? So does the Easter bunny. It all makes good sense. You have to start telling children, though, when they're really young about the resurrection, 
they otherwise won't get it. Because in some ways, the resurrection actually looks just like Wile E. Coyote. He dies and he comes right back. Later on, we start taking that, we start making a distinction between the quality of those historical narratives, but the, the narrative structure um, is actually the same. The arc of the narrative is actually the same. Once children, though, have a sufficient mastery of time and space, then they start crafting myths, life myths. And they can have multiple life myths when they're young and they're trying to figure out who they are. When they start asking why, 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 they're actually asking for stories to give them a relatedness among archetypes to help them to build some narratives. Once they add myths, once they have a myth, then they create characters. And then they assign themselves a character. Am I helper, sage, healer, warrior, escapist, survivor, ritualist, lover, friend? All of those are characters that I can assign myself inside of certain narratives. And so then I look for stories and myths that account for my assigned identities, which is actually why I think it's hard for most of us to emulate Jesus. Because we assign Jesus the imago of God, healer, perfect teacher, something that we can't be. And so then when we're looking in those stories, we don't see ourselves adopting that particular character. We adopt another character inside the story, which is why it's really difficult for us to take on the work of Jesus. And if we don't give Jesus the, the mythology of God, then maybe we wouldn't follow his stories anyway. And so it's a really difficult way. So the way that we myth make actually makes it more difficult for us to adopt the ways of Jesus. The, the, the larger point is this, though. People often want to start reconciliation processes by uncovering all of the facts and then using facts as the basis upon which we will go forward together. And the truth is, I can tell you this as a trial lawyer, the truth is facts lose their significance outside of story. It is always the better formed story that wins the case. It's not the compelling facts that win the case, it's the better formed story that wins, that moves people. We don't, tra we don't transmit knowledge as separate and distinct data points. We transmit it in story form. If we were transmitting as separate and distinct data points, we would say the world is created in this order. Light and dark, heaven and earth, sea and land, vegetation, fish, fowl, animals, human beings. It was very good. But that's not how we remember it. That's not how we tell it. In order for it to be meaningful, in order for it to be memorable, we have to add some story to it, some story form. And so we say, in the beginning, God. And then, and then to add context and make it memorable, you know, so that people can really get a picture of it, we say, the spirit hovered over the face of the deep, right? And then you can start seeing it. And you say, boom, God created. He said, let there be light. He separated light and dark. And it's only once you've separated light and dark and you've assigned them names, evening and the morning were the first day, that you've introduced the concept of time. But you need that whole story in order for it to make sense that we should rest on the seventh day. Because if you just tell the distinct facts, then resting on the seventh day actually doesn't have any value. It also, we need that story so that when I tell you about this place in South Africa, where I spent my 50th birthday, right at the tip of South Africa. There's a place where the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean meet, where the plates meet, and you can't really see it during the day, but at night when the sun is setting, the sun sets about 50, maybe 90 seconds on the Atlantic Ocean before it sets on the Indian Ocean, and in that moment, you can imagine, you can actually see where God divided light and darkness, which is why people get goosebumps, which is why people cry, because people can still believe that that story is possible. But they only get that in story. You don't, you don't get that just in separate and distinct fact patterns. 